All right. So recapping uh, the game, like I said, after I was very proud of how we responded after a really tough moment with Grayson's injury. Um, in reflection, it's probably 30 years of, of being on a college field, the scariest moment I've had uh, and felt so bad for him and his parents. I thought our trainer, Justin Smith, our head of athletic trainer, did an amazing job on that field with his team in the docks, managing the chaos at the moment, keeping everybody calm. Um, did a tremendous job, you know, and after the game, <clears throat> when uh, information was coming back on how everything was going, communication was great. And, uh, you know, got to spend time with Grayson and his family at the hospital after the game, all the scans and things they did came back clean. He was in good spirits, has been released. Uh, came, actually, Saturday night was released and is, you know, with his girlfriend and his parents recovering. He's in the concussion protocol and uh, we'll give him time, you know, to go through all the steps that he wants to go through before we talk any more about kind of what the next steps are. You know, I think it's only fair to him and his family to allow them that opportunity and be supportive of him as he goes through this tough time. I'm thankful that he is, um, for the most part, okay. You know, it's just a, a concussion. And when you see a guy get hit in college football or in pro football in the head, it's it's one thing. But when the helmet comes off and then he gets hit, that's another. And, and so that was a really weird thing. Uh, you know, I don't think there was any malicious intent. It was a, a clean hit from the side when his helmet came off and the other player coming in. It's a tough play. And, um, you know, a lot of people have asked me about the play. Was it targeting? Wasn't it? And, and I'm not here to criticize our officials at all. Um, I do think that the rule probably needs to be studied. Um, the letter of that, the letter of the law, that rule, uh, he was not a defenseless player as a runner. And <clears throat> if you hit somebody with the crown of your head or you launch yourself, uh, into somebody's head with the crown of your head that's targeting and in that particular case it was the front of the guy's helmet that actually hit Grayson and so you know obviously when you see a play like that you think why does it matter what part of the head hits him at all and uh scary moment so talked to him on the phone a little bit ago he's he's uh, in good spirits he's excited to be back around the team and we'll go through all the proper steps with him and be there right behind him. Um, when I was talking to him at the hospital, we were talking about the play itself. He hadn't seen it. And his dad and mom were in the room. <clears throat> and he said, Coach, I thought about sliding. And then I said, no, nah, I'm not doing that. And uh, he just has given the game so much. He's such a competitor. He's such a warrior. And I know myself and everybody around here, we were pulling hard for him. And so it's just not what you expected in the game. Um, turning from that event to our sideline, seeing our guys and how emotional they were, is, uh, you know, in the moment, wasn't even thinking about the rest of the guys, thinking about him. You know, like, dang, how are we going to get these guys back on track here? This is tough. And it was. There was a lot of tears on our sideline. And so, yeah, I was proud um, that we got back in the game. Uh, C.J. Bailey came in and did a really nice job. Uh, didn't get a lot of reps last week um, as a backup. You know, you never get as many as the starter. And then the disappointment is that we didn't finish. And, you know, really disappointed in that. It's something that we take a lot of pride in as a program. And uh, had plenty of opportunities in the fourth quarter, really uh, 10 minutes left in the game, 10-point lead. And multiple, multiple times plays presented themselves to us that we could have got off the field uh, defensively or made a play uh, defensively or a third and three on offense where we don't protect the way that we're capable of. Just felt like we didn't finish. No, we didn't finish. And that was disappointing, really disappointing uh, as a coach. And so I own that as always. Uh, I got to get our team to finish better. And our players will own that as well. They got to finish. But I'm proud of CJ, and uh, this team will battle for him. I thought Kendrick Raphael really battled in that game, ran hard, protected well. Our outside receivers continue to improve. I thought Noah Rogers and Wesley Grimes 
Terrell Anderson, Keenan Jackson all caught the ball well and did some things with their legs after the catch. Justin Jolie did the same. Made a really nice play on third down and strained for a first, and we ended up scoring on that drive. <clears throat> and then had the touchdown you know, later in the game. You know, negatives, we had two turnovers that we forced on defense that we got zero points out of offensively in the third quarter. Um, and we opened the third quarter. We scored right before the half, uh, knowing we'd get the ball back to open the third quarter. I thought, all right, we can get some momentum here and didn't. Went three and out. So that was a disappointing drive. You know, and we got beaten protection uh, in some critical spots. We had some guys wide open on a couple plays, and, and CJ got rushed and couldn't get the ball to him. We had KC on a screen and go. Um, and then on that third and three, we had a high-low route, and he couldn't throw the ball to him. And so we got to be better. It wasn't just on the O-line. There was um, two on a running backs, and, and then on the O-line. We got to be better in those moments. You know, on defense, we got uh, two takeaways. And then we had a couple strips we didn't capitalize on. One of them was one of the plays I'm mentioning. You know, Cooley does a great job stripping the quarterback. The ball's right there, and three of our players are there, one of theirs, and they get the ball back. And that would have ended the game. You know, I thought our DBs played man-to-man -man coverage very well uh, in the game. Uh, didn't make enough plays, and we were in zone defense. Obviously, they outjumped us for one in the corner of the end zone on a third and ten, which is a play we need to make. Uh, we had poor eyes at linebacker a couple times on play action. And then the roughing penalty was was a critical error. Um, we were really good on third down defensively, 8 of 11 successfully. We were 0 for 3 on fourth down, and those were all in the fourth quarter. Our special teams was really kind of a wash in the game. Uh, we were 3 of 4 on field goals. I think our punter is better than he showed. He had one extremely good punt. Excuse me. And – uh they called us for being in the backfield, which I don't see on film, um, which hurt his average. But he did have a shanked punt earlier in the game, and, and their punter did as well. So, really, the, the special teams were not a factor for either team in that game. And in the past, they have been. Um, now we move on. You know, we're at the halfway point of the season, three and three, obviously not where we want to be. Uh, but we have a lot to play for and uh, excited about – the next opportunity with Syracuse, they're a four and one team coming off an overtime win um, on the road at UNLV. Uh, really good quarterback and Kyle McCord, obviously a nationally known guy from Ohio State. Really good arm, poised, experienced. He's won a lot of games. The receivers have a lot of experience. Pena is a guy we've seen for a long time. He's a good returner as well. Gadsden was out last year, but the year before we played him and he made a lot of plays on us. Uh, and receiver no, uh, number seven, Meeks. The running back, Allen's an experienced back, and they get the ball to him a lot of ways. They're putting up really good numbers on offense, particularly in the air, and uh, will be a great challenge, an opportunity for us. Defensively, they play a lot uh, of different things. They've been four down. They've been three down. Um, some the entire game. Sometimes they do both in, in the game. So there's a lot, really two systems that they're merging Number 10, Diggs is a disruptive player, plays defensive end and linebacker, has eight TFLs and four sacks. <clears throat> and they're big up front, yeah, really big D-line, a lot of experience, nine guys in their defensive depth chart that have been starters at one time. Uh, and Pena, like I mentioned, is a really dynamic returner. Excited to have our uh, night game at home. We've had three straight home or uh, noon games. And I know from a crowd standpoint, we've always had great energy in our, our night games. We'll be in our all-black uniform and uh, hope that we have an incredible crowd. You know, with our fans, I know all of us wanted better than three and three. Trust me, no one's more uh, disappointed than me and our players. But I also know NC State's about fighting and not giving up, and that's where we're at. You know, we've been in worse situations and, and and rallied and had really good finishes and that's what we're going to try to do. We got six games, six, six opportunities. We'll take them all one at a time, and we'll work our butts off. With a lot to play for and a lot to to fight for. And I know it's frustrating. Well, I feel your pain, but I know one thing about this school: we don't quit. We dig in and fight, and we stick together. And that's what I'm asking for uh, with our fans. We need your help in this game. Crowd noise matters at home. You're playing a team that throws the ball on the road and having you behind us would mean a lot.
with that, I'll open it up for questions. <clears throat> Ori? David, I know you gave an update on, on Grayson, but are there any updates at this point on guys like Hollywood Smothers, Brandon Cisse, Dakari Collins, and Val Erickson that missed this game as well? No. Okay. Um, at this point, is there any other guys that uh, you expect to have back for this upcoming game? Yeah, I don't have to discuss injuries, Corey, so I'm not going to. I'm giving you the update on Grayson because of how public the injury was. But there are no rules around that, and I'd rather not talk about their health. Okay, I completely understand that. As far as the game coming up against Syracuse, uh, Kyle McCord, what have you seen from him as far as his play to this point? Uh, you can see that he's uh, experienced, knows where he's going with the football, has touch, has strength of his arm you know, uh, can scramble to throw. He's not really a runner, although he did have a really good run for a touchdown where he jumped over a guy on the goal line in their last win. But he is more of a scrambler to throw the football. Um, and he's got weapons around him, you know. He does. And, and they got a lot of different type of pass game. They use the screens well. They throw it down the field, vertical, horizontal both. But he's a good quarterback, man. You can tell that he knows what he's doing and he's playing at a high level. Uh, Ethan McDowell. Hey, Coach. CJ's now has played in five games, and in two of those games he had to come in for an injured Grayson McCall, and then, of course, um, he had to start – his first start was on the road against Clemson. Um, so he's been in some tough spots. How have you seen him respond to those spots and what makes you confident and, you know, having him under center moving forward as long as he is? Yeah. Well, he's handled adversity very well. Uh He's got great energy and enthusiasm and belief in himself. He gets better with each game. You can see him improving. And uh, he loves football, you know. He, he just really enjoys the process of going through the game plan and practice. And he's not an excuse guy either. When he makes a mistake, he's the first one to own it. And I just think he's a guy people want to play for, you know. And he's also a great teammate. I mean, he hurts for Grayson and – Grayson's a good mentor to him, and, and Lex Thomas the same way. Those guys are really tight, that group of guys. And and so CJ is going to play well. He's going to come in and play really well. I'm excited for him. Noah? Hey, Coach, as you mentioned, you guys are six games in at the halfway point. How would you assess where the run game is at this point of the season? You know, I would say early on it was pretty bad, and it got better. Um Thought it got quite a bit better against Clemson. Um, NIU, not great. I think we had some good runs in that game, um, but we didn't turn the ball over. And that was a physical front. I uh, had some good runs in this game. I think if you watch the game, our, how our game plan was, there was a lot of plays that were runs where we threw the football. And so we took the numbers, took the leverage, I guess you'd say. Had we handed off some of those, there could have been some pretty explosive runs if you look at how the box was on some of those plays. So there are improvements in some ways. Uh, am I happy with it? No. I'll tell you what I am happy with. I'm happy with how hard the receivers are blocking. I think uh, Kendrick Raphael is running really hard, physical, making plays with his feet. So I am happy with that part of it, you know, but we can get better there. And then a quick follow-up. You talked about Kendrick. How have you seen him grow from his freshman year to his sophomore year? Well, he's gained weight. You know, he worked really hard in the offseason uh, to help himself, one, for his health, but two, for protection, to be able to take on linebackers. I think he learned a lot last year being a little undersized. <clears throat> and so his work ethic has helped his durability and strength. Uh, and the game's a little bit slower for him. I think he's just got reps, you know, and you get better and better. But he's really competitive. And I'm not surprised, you know, the high school he played at in Appleside that a split back veer offense. He's kind of both tailbacks in that offense or fullbacks half the time and tailbacks half the time. They blocked as much as they ran the ball, you know. So he's brought up uh, as a tough running back, not some guy that's just a skill back back there. He likes the contact of the game. <clears throat> James? Dave, you may already have just touched on this, but the the passing numbers for you guys was up this this week in terms of attempts. Is that a lot based off of RPOs and different things like that, or was it the game plan to go in and really look to throw it a little more? Yeah, it was both. We wanted to get the ball to our outside guys, but a lot of 
the run game um, in college football, not just for us. You know, if people are going to play a certain way in the secondary, you're going to take what they give you at times with bubbles or smokes or slants or hitches or outs and make people put bodies on bodies to lighten the box, you know. And so when we were getting those lighter boxes, uh, softer secondary pictures, we were throwing the ball out there more because of what they were presenting. And that's why the numbers were up. If you actually look at the play itself, you're going to see a lot of run blocking going on on those quick throws because they were run plays with tagged RPOs. And just to follow up, the fourth and nine, they picked up running the football. Can you just discuss that play a little bit, what went down up front? Yeah, we had a line stunt. We were playing um, coverage on the play. You know, obviously, he wasn't a quarterback that ran around a lot. We had a a uh, four-man uh, pass rush called, and we did a poor job executing the line stunt. We got no penetration, no disruption. Uh, the game we had called is actually a really good game for quarterback draws and things like that, and we didn't execute it very well. We had worked hard on that. I know it was something Coach Wiles spoke a lot about yesterday in our meeting. He was disappointed in that play. Felt like we'd be able to capture the quarterback with that game, and obviously they did a better job than we did on that play. That was a tough one. You get somebody fourth and nine, you ought to get off the field. Thanks, Dave. Yep. Jaden, have you talked to the league uh, at all about uh, just the the what happened on the play and, um, you know, looking <laughs> at the targeting rule? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've talked to the league, and I can't discuss that conversation. That's private. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Al Riveron, head of officials, and that's one thing we don't do is is publicly talk about those conversations. I think he and I are on the same page um, with the fact that the targeting rule itself needs to be studied. I think the language in it puts the refs in a tough spot, particularly on a play like that one. I mean, that was – you guys have watched a lot of football – not a lot of plays where a helmet comes off and at the same time someone else is coming in to hit him like that. And so it really highlights the rule and, and the verbiage of the rule. And so, yeah, I do think in talking to him, there's going to be a lot of conversation uh, from an officiating side about the language of targeting and is this the right way to officiate the rule? I know he felt terrible uh, about what happened and I have a lot of respect for him and how he does his job. And to follow up, is <laughs> so the play wasn't ruled dead because the ball came out before Grayson hit the ground. Is that correct? Yeah, it was a fumble. Uh, Brian Murphy? Yeah, thanks. Just to follow up on that real quick, should the play have been ruled dead? When, when the helmet comes off, I thought normally they rule a play dead. Yeah, it's a good question. I, You know, the ball came out simultaneously, so they didn't rule it dead. I could see where that could happen. But, um, again, you're asking me to officiate, and I'm not an official, you know. I mean, some of those calls are on the field in the moment. If a guy continues to play with his helmet off, you usually see that. But, as you know, that, that play, he went directly to the ground. And so, I don't um, know. It's a okay. tough one. Sorry, I, um, I know it's a, a bit of a sensitive topic, but but it, at, at any point in your career, have you ever told a player, like, I, I can't put you back out there? Like, is that a decision you feel comfortable making as a coach? Or will you let the doctor and the player and his family tell you, hey, we want to play, we've been cleared, we can go back out there? Or at some point as a coach, do you say, I, I just don't feel comfortable putting you back out there? Yeah, I'm going to always – first start with the doctors and the family and the young man. And and obviously if I felt that way, I have no problem making that call. Um, but I'm going to start with them, you know, and I think that's the right way to do it. But yeah, I mean, I have three sons and I would want them to be treated the same way that I'm going to treat these guys. And if that's where we're at, that's where we'll be. But I have no problem making that decision if that's where we end up. But I, you know, the steps are not head coach first. It's, medical team first, family, and then bring the head coach in. Here's where we're at. Do you, do you get a sense that you'll, you're will you at that point with Grayson at all? Is, is he talking about coming uh, back this year? Yeah, I mean, like I told you, I'm going to let them go through the steps. And once we do that, then we'll have a conversation publicly. But he deserves that opportunity, Brian. I'm not going to supersede what he's asking for. Rob? 
Yeah, Dave, you mentioned the uh, changing fronts and schemes that Syracuse does defensively. How difficult is it to prepare for that? And does having a younger quarterback sort of accentuate that difficulty? Yeah, I mean, I think we got to get into our game plan here and see where we think their weaknesses are and what their tendencies are and why they're getting into these fronts. You know, how random is it? You know, is it more down and distance? Is it more formation related? Is it was just this team they did that and it never showed up again? Like, when you just watch five games, it's all over the place. You know what I mean? But when you start to really get into it, you can find out how challenging it really going to be. And at this point, I couldn't tell you that. Like, we're in the middle of game planning right now. So, but for a freshman quarterback, he's seen a lot, man. Rob, I mean, Clemson presented everything, you know. And I, you did a lot of stuff on defense. CJ's already seen a lot, and he's got a veteran center with them. And we'll have to make the plan, obviously, one that he feels good about. And that's our job as coaches to help him with that. Yeah, and I hear you in terms of you're making your plans now, but assuming that there are devi deviations and such, is this a week where maybe Grayson being on the sideline, helping out, could be really vital for your team, speaking to Bailey and to Lex? Yeah, I mean, Grayson's going to be a coach one day, I have a feeling, and he's pretty damn good with those guys, you know. So if that's where he's at helping them, he's great, you know, with those guys on the sideline and – no matter what it is, you know, whether they're playing us an odd the whole game, 4-2 the whole game, or both, he's going to be really good with those guys on the sideline. Thank you, sir. Uh, JC? Obviously, you've, you've talked a lot about McCord, and you mentioned Diggs, and then Meeks, the wide receiver. They all came through. <clears throat> they all came through the transfer portal. Big picture-wise, it is show how fast a team can turn things around. Because if you take those three guys off, Syracuse is a radically different squad. Yeah, I mean, I think getting the right guys, guys that fit uh, a need and guys that are good players can really help you. I mean, you see it both ways in some cases. But, yeah, I think the portal can be a transitional thing, particularly for a new coach coming in, you know, where they may have had some glaring spots, as you mentioned. I mean, getting the quarterback that they have right now has completely changed his opportunity as a head coach in year one. And I go back to when I got here and I got Jacoby Brissett, but he had to sit out for my first year. And we went from three wins in year one to eight wins in year two because of that position change, you know. I mean, that position is the most important in football. You can look at every NFL team, every college team, every high school team. If there's a really good player at quarterback, they usually have a pretty good record. They usually do. And they got a good quarterback. Kyle McCord's a good player. James? Dave, it feels like uh, Tamarcus Cooley is is really coming on for you guys. Looks like he made yeah. some plays again this past week. Just evaluate yeah. him and, and your thoughts so far. Yeah, I'm really uh, impressed with his improvement. His last two games, he's been very good in coverage and zone, uh, blitzing, fitting the run. He's getting better and better each week. Really talented athlete. We knew that when he got here. He had a lot to learn. And and to his credit, he really worked hard at improving. Coach Freddie, Autry Lindsay does a great job with our nickels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tamarcus has been a positive a spark for our defense for sure. And, and I wanted to follow up on that. I don't know if you guys <laughs> brought him in to start or anything like that, but it seems like you really threw a lot of darts in a sense in the transfer portal at defensive back. And you brought in a bunch of guys not, and not maybe not knowing what they would do. Looking back on that, you feel like that really kind of paid off for you just because maybe some are projecting out a little differently than you expected early on? Well, I think some of it's because of injuries and losses that we had, you know, guys leaving uh, our team to go play more somewhere else. And when you add guys and then Devin Boykin got hurt in the bowl game, you know, that was a position group that we felt like needed some older players and competition in the room while we developed some of the younger guys. Damon Fagan's injured as well. And so our returning guys weren't healthy, and we had some good freshmen coming in who I really am excited about. And you know, Ronnie Royal is going to be a really good player here. Uh, Assad is going to be a really good player. Javon Bailey is getting better. But you don't want to go from, you know, senior to true freshman at every spot. You want to have that differential. And so we knew we needed to add some guys. And, yeah, did we take too many? I don't think so. I mean, they've all played. And – um competed and some of them have been banged up along the way but 
the reason we did is pretty obvious. Thanks. Uh, Jaden. I hate to go back to Grayson, but and I don't even know if you can answer this, but um, are you able to share what sort of tests uh, were performed on Saturday? After the game? Yeah, at the hospital. Yeah, I mean, he went through every test you can go through. Um, but I'm not going to get into it. I mean, look, the, the, he's at the trauma center. That's the number one trauma center in Wake County. They put every single resource into what they do and had really glowing results coming out of there other than he has a concussion, you know. So you feel good about it because, as you all know, head injuries can have a lot of other things, swelling, blood, and all of none of that. So, you know, feel fortunate that all we're dealing with is a, a concussion. But for him, there's been multiple in his career, as you know. So, yeah, but that the hospitals here in – in Wake County, and we're fortunate, you know, in the Research Triangle to have the medical care that we do. Uh, two more, Corey. Dave, Justin Jolie has had a strong start to the season so far to this point. Uh, had a big touchdown the other day as well. Um, just your thoughts on what you've seen from him to this point, a guy that's been able to miss it, make a, a lot of guys miss on tackles, and um, obviously yeah. that's been able to make some contested catches too. Yeah, he's get he's a really good ball catcher. He's good um yards after catch. He's hard to tackle. He's quick feet, good in space, elevates for the ball, can track the ball. Uh, he's competitive. He's getting better without the ball. I mean, that's the biggest area we've been working hard with him is, you know, how to block in space, how to be good on different types of blocks and when the pictures change, you know, defenses aren't always how they line up how to adjust and he's continuing to improve in that, but he's been a great asset to our offense and he's just getting better each week. He works really hard and he's a fun kid to coach. As a quick follow-up to that, how important is it to have a guy like that, a big body tight end across the middle for, you know, a young quarterback as well? Yeah, helps a lot. Quarterbacks love big targets for sure. And having a guy that can sit in space and make plays and it doesn't have to be a perfect ball for him to bring it in with his catch radius that helps the quarterback tremendously. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.